For most of human history, people were governed, if at all, by kings, generals, or despots of various kinds. And in the late 18th century, a new idea took hold in the United States, that people should govern themselves <clears throat> by choosing their leaders in free and fair elections, and then subjecting those leaders to constitutional constraints and a rule of law to limit their power. This idea spread gradually through the 19th and 20th centuries and suffered many reversals. But in 1974, a third wave of global democratization began, and it brought about transitions to democracy in the remaining three authoritarian countries of Western Europe, Portugal, Spain, and Greece. And then it spread to Latin America and brought down most of the military dictatorships there through grassroots civic mobilization and international pressure. And countries like Argentina, Brazil, and Chile became democracies again. And it spread to East Asia, and again through peaceful civic mobilization, countries like the Philippines, Korea, and Taiwan became democracies. In 1989, as you know, the Berlin Wall fell, and the democratic wave brought new democracies to Central and Eastern Europe, countries that had been uh, ruled under Soviet uh, domination by communist regimes. And uh, by the uh, early 1990s, for the first time in world history, uh, the majority of states in the world were democracies. And many of them were uh, even multi-party regimes in sub-Saharan Africa. The democratic wave peaked in 2004, 2005, with an iconic and deeply moving event, the Ukrainian Re uh, Orange Revolution which uh, mobilized the citizens of Ukraine against a corrupt, autocratic, post-communist regime, won the election, had it stolen by the uh, communist uh, successor state, and then the people poured into the streets uh, in extraordinary numbers to demand and defend their election victory, and ultimately they prevailed. That was uh, in January of 2005. Uh, and that was the peak of the third wave of democratization. Beginning in 2006, the wave began to reverse. And we've been in an 18-year period of democratic backsliding. It is no longer the case, as it was through the 1990s and early 2000s, that the majority of states in the world are democracies. And Freedom House has documented 18 consecutive years of more countries declining in freedom than gaining. Uh, we are now in what can be called a wave of authoritarian populism. And we can understand the nature of this wave and the appeals of this model if we think a little bit about the tragic case of Venezuela. Venezuela emerged uh, in the late 1950s from a decade of civil strife with a renewed commitment to democracy and a resolve on the part of its two political parties to resolve their differences only by peaceful and constitutional means. The two parties alternated in power and used the burgeoning oil wealth of the country to develop the country. Uh, a middle class grew, jobs expanded, uh, and the democratic governments were able to use the oil wealth to expand education, healthcare, physical infrastructure, uh, and economic opportunity. And people came to identify democracy with prosperity and economic possibilities. But in the 1980s, the price of oil collapsed, and the Venezuelan economy, which had been far too dependent on oil revenue, fell into a very deep recession. And people began to question whether democracy was really working for them. And in 1992, along came a radical military officer, Hugo Chavez, who said, uh, I have the answer, and it's to get rid of the entire system and replace it with a radical new model. He tried to do so by a military coup. He failed. Uh, he was sentenced to prison. 
but he only served two years and then he was amnestied. And he came back in the late 1990s and said, I'll try to do at the ballot box what I failed to do by a military coup. And he offered the country a radical populist model of transformation that won him the presidential election and won his party control of the Congress. Uh, if we understand the narrative that Chavez used uh, in the late 1990s, which has been adopted by many subsequent authoritarian populists, and the playbook he used to conquer power once he was elected, we can understand a lot about the challenges we face now. The authoritarian populist narrative is that all of the parties and politicians and institutions of the country are hopelessly corrupt and need to be replaced. It's not just that previous rulers have ruled badly, made bad choices, need to be uh, alternated in power. It's that everything needs to be swept away. And moreover, it's infused with a kind of moralistic outrage that the good deserving people of the country have been betrayed by a series of corrupt uh, elites. Uh, and that the only possibility for progress is by sweeping and total institutional transformation, including the replacement of the existing constitution with a new constitution that will give the populist leader and movement the defender of the good deserving people of the country, total power to transform the system. With that goes the argument, the suggestion, the suspicion, the conspiracy theory that there's an enemy within. For Chavez, it was the liberal elite of the country. Uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, it has been uh, a vulnerable minority, the Roma, or now the immigrants. Historically, it has been, uh, in many countries, the Jews. And in India today, uh, it is the Muslim minority. Whoever it is, the idea is, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's the LGBT community often. This is a dangerous minority that needs to be controlled uh, and even purged uh, from our ranks. And the populist leader says, the country is broken, the institutions have failed us, and only I can fix it. And this is the model that has been used and the narrative that has been deployed by a growing number of um, uh, political leaders with authoritarian ambitions to try and win and concentrate power and barricade themselves and their parties in power once they come to power at the ballot box. We've seen this model with Viktor Orban uh, in Hungary, who returned to power with a vengeance in 2014, uh, with Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his Justice and Development Party in Turkey, which has now been in power for 21 years, with Jair Bolsonaro and his right-wing populist party, which won the 2018 presidential election in Brazil, and of course in India with Narendra Modi and his Hindu chauvinist BJP, which just won its third successive term for control of India's parliament. These leaders all have a common playbook, and it begins by demonizing the opposition as not just, as I said, wrong-headed and mistaken, but as morally beyond the pale, as irretrievably corrupt and dangerous and disloyal to the country. They warn that the media that are criticizing them or holding them accountable to the truth and the facts are fake news and need to be purged uh, and controlled. And they uh, seek very early on to purge the judiciary of independent jurists who might hold them accountable and stack the courts with political loyalists who will do their bidding and protect their interests. And then they go after every segment of the state, the civil service, the police, the tax authorities, the intelligence uh, apparatus, the military, and seek to gain domination and partisan control over all these instruments of power. 
so that they can weaponize them against their opponents, uh, dominate uh, the political system, and intimidate all dimensions of civil society. Uh, voluntary organizations, trade unions, professional associations, student associations, artists and intellectuals, the goal is to silence them into submission. This is a, an alarming story, uh, which many of us have been watching unfold with trepidation in the last two decades. But it's not uh, an inevitable uh, reality. All of these autocrats have weaknesses, and they basically derive from the fact that they're all corrupt because they eliminate checks on their power, uh, and they need and crave the legitimacy of repeated elections to show that they embody the popular will. We have seen through various movements for uh, democratic change and the reassertion of checks and balances that these people can be defeated at the ballot box <clears throat> as they were in Brazil in 2022, uh, in Poland in the recent uh, democratic uh, victory of the civic coalition in October of 2023, and just this past July when democratic forces came together in Venezuela and defeated Chavez's successor, Nicolas Maduro, in an election that was massively unfair but the opposition still uh, was able not only to win a two-to-one two victory, but by monitoring the vote to demonstrate that they had won that victory. And now it falls to us, the international community, to compel Maduro to recognize the results. The victories don't always come in national elections. Sometimes they begin at the municipal level. And in Turkey uh, in 2019, and, and even more so in 2024, the Democratic uh, opposition won stunning elections, led by uh, this man, Ekrem Imamoglu, the mayor of Istanbul, through a very innovative campaign of what they called radical love. And the key principle here is political uh, uh, inclusion and seeking to counter the polarizing, divisive, hateful rhetoric of the authoritarian populist. The principles here are very simple. First of all, you have to unite all the elements of the democratic opposition in a common campaign to bring about electoral alternation. Secondly, <clears throat> the logic must be not to play into the polarizing logic of the populist, but to bridge it and transcend it, as I've said, through a campaign a very broad inclusion and even empathy. The third is not to assume that people will vote on democracy alone. It would be wonderful, but it's not the way everyone votes. And so we must appeal to people's material concerns and interests, their hopes for a better life, their demands for evidence that a new kind of government can give them jobs and economic opportunity and a better form of government. The democratic opposition in these circumstances has learned that you can't win by being tentative and weak and abstract. Democrats must exhibit strong leadership, confident, vigorous, uh, with a vision of the future, and thereby demonstrate that you don't have to be a strong man to be an effective and strong leader. And finally, we've learned in every one of these instances that you have a better chance of winning as a democratic opposition if you can take back the flag from the xenophobic nationalism of illiberal populists and show that the best form of patriotism is pride in country as a democracy. <clears throat> now, uh, we have learned through struggle and difficult history over many decades, that the only way to assure that democracy will survive is through active, engaged, informed, and um, confident uh, democratic participation by the citizenry. Democracy is not a spectator sport. It requires the commitment of all of us to vote, to urge our fellow citizens to vote, to participate in other ways in the political process, in campaigns and so on. 
In these days, to counter the divisive, polarizing rhetoric on social media <clears throat> with hopeful messages of unity, and to teach our children through a renewed effort at civic education the blessings of liberty, uh, the promise of democracy, uh, and the uh, opportunity that democracy can provide through freedom and rule of law for people to realize their aspirations and dreams and be who they want to be. This is how we can reverse the current wave of authoritarian populism and renew the promise of democracy as the best form of government. Thank you.